Hey there, fellow followers. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. We're at Outlaw Moon Games and Toys. And hark! And look upon the comet of Caiaphon and know that its heralds are coming upon us. And know what they want. They want you to learn about Starspawn here on WebDM. Let's look to the stars. Oh my god. Uh, Starspawn. Okay. Oh yeah. Yet another aberration. Mm -hmm. Another cool another aberration. collective of aberrations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a very interesting group. I love I, it, right? I, right. Like I, I really hope that before we like dig into it, I really hope that we see more monsters in in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons that are of this caliber. Yeah. And like I, I'm kind of curious as to who designed them. I kind of hope it's Rob Schwab because the Demon Lord himself has his hand on, like. The Demon Lord's hands all over this one. I really hope that it's uh, that's him. Yeah, you know, he knows how to make a monster. Um, I like them because they first off they've got a, a lot of great lore. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great ways when you're even just reading the little bit that's in Mordenkainen's where you can see how you would maybe fit them into a campaign, especially if you have a great old one warlock or, or something yeah. like that. You've got this great lore of they they come from the stars and their their arrival is heralded by a comet or perhaps they travel on the comet or, or something like that. Yeah, I'd like to think that they are inside that They're comet. inside that it's comet, this right. maggoty collective of, of these awful things. Right. Like, traversing <laughs> yeah. the stars in these fiery chariots. Yeah, yeah. They, these are the forms that they wear when they travel to the prime material, but they're grotesque and, and mm. malformed and, you know, it's like they're not from this reality so they don't quite know what they should be doing here or how they should look and act and behave and then you get to like the stats of them and you're like holy crap <laughs> like almost every one of these monsters synergizes with another one of them mm -hmm. to create an encounter with like layered complexity and tricks that the monsters can pull on the players and all of this stuff that that you can surprise the players with and if you have challenge oriented players who who are like you know optimizing their characters and like figuring out the best strategies that work for them as a group then a, a group of monsters like this can like present a challenge to them mm -hmm. that is satisfying uh, and, and even if you don't have a group that's challenge oriented then they get like a terrifying encounter with these aberrations from b the dark between the stars and you know it's not just uh you know any other fight because the monsters are like building off of each other and, and yeah there's just so many tools that you have beyond just like a basic attack and a move to make for a memorable encounter it's a one-two punch that i really like star spawn for uh, one two three four sometimes six punches. sure why not uh <laughs> but what, you gotta wonder what the hell's going on between the stars I, that, that, one, that right. keeps like birthing these Horrid abominations from your worst <laughs> nightmares, right? Like, right. you know, because it does play into that, that, you know, that deep vastness and like, you know, you don't want to know what's there. You don't, right? <laughs> like, this is sort of like that touches on the mythos themes, others kind of cosmic horror and that uh, knowledge of the unknowable is usually a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, forbidden knowledge, knowledge that, that, that makes you worse or that you regret knowing uh, certainly would play into this. But... I'm, it, it makes me really think, like, how, number one, we come back to the question that we've explored a couple of other times in the Spell School uh, shows, which is, like, how scientific is your world, is your setting? Does it have a, a basis of, you know, sort of our own world, because that's your entry point for it, it makes things easier? Or is it truly a magical place where the stars are not, you know, burning balls of gas set in a, a you know, a, a cosmic void that's ruled by gravity and, and other sort of mm -hmm. universal forces, but is instead, like, magical. And the cosmos is a, a realm that's thick with portals and manifestations of magical phenomenon and, and, and creatures of ancient power and lineage. And it's just crowded with all of these yeah. things. Like, it, there's already enough going on here. Yeah, know? yeah. Looking through these, and I'm, maybe because I'm playing through a massive Nyarlathotep Call of Cthulhu campaign, where it's all about the heralding of a comet, and yeah. we're fighting the Maggot Lord. Yeah. And, like, I mean, it's right there. Yeah, like, yeah. this is, like, the D&D ified version of that kind of, that, that horror that is, Absolutely. that is coming for you. I don't know. I love how evocative that is, uh, and how terrifying it is. And it does make you wonder, like, if you're on a D&D world, and you're looking at a telescope, are you looking at monsters staring back down at you? Mm -hmm. They are gazing upon your world. They're coming. It's going to take them forever to get here, or because they're so massive, and, and the scale of their existence is so much more than we can comprehend, 
spend, they do spend eons in slumber. Yeah. Or or it might just take them a long time to to move somewhere or to yeah. you know to get there. Yeah. One of the favorite things I liked about fourth edition was the star packed warlock. Yeah. And oh, it was the, fun. The fact that there there seemed to be and I, I didn't delve too deep in it. There was a dragon uh, article that came out right around when fourth edition came out uh, that that really dug into it. But it was basically like there were these forces from beyond reality that could possess stars or manifested themselves as stars. We see the legacy of that in in uh, fifth edition in spells like the Arms of Hadar or Hunger of Hadar or Caiaphon's Blessing or something yeah, yeah. like that. These were the names of these particular elder evils in fourth edition, and and I, I just like that. Right, I like the idea of of using star magic, celestial magic, mm -hmm. um, in the celestial sense, not like in the good aligned, heavenly sense that right. D&D uses it. You kind of, you can sort of see where it's like, all right, is, is star magic benevolent? Is it, is it you, know, you know, goddesses and, and, and gods of the sun and moon seem to be related to this, but also like the further out from your solar system you get, the worse the mm -hmm. powers that inhabit <laughs> these uh, celestial bodies are, it, I, there's a lot of questions there to, yeah. to answer. And if you're gonna include these great cosmic beings in your world and, and to have them influence it and to visit the world and, mm -hmm. and exert their influence over the people there, and sort of giving it some thought, like what does it mean? What exactly is the dark between the stars in my yeah. world? What well, are stars? Yeah, and I, and I like the star spawn is basically, they could, they could, since they are heralds of doom, they are basically the manifestation of the first thoughts of that elder being right. being cast at a certain planet or yeah. place mm -hmm. or whatever. Like mm -hmm. the first thought of it going like, maybe I need to go there. Yeah. And just because of that, the star spawn are now on their way. Yeah, and, they're taking and, on and, forms. And, well, and, and, and even in our own, in, in, the, in the world, yeah. people use like the patterns of, of celestial uh, repetition. Sure. Comets yeah. coming around the mm -hmm. same time. That once they actually learn like, oh, yeah, every six and a half years, right. this comet's going to come by. Yeah. So you can start using that to manipulate the people. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. if the comet is actually manipulating you? Right. Slowly. Slowly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. You it's, sort of like, where we, is we, the influence coming from? You know, the, in our world, there was this principle of as above, so below. And so you would, uh, you know, medieval scholars and the like would look to the stars to say, diagnose an illness with someone. Right, be like, well, what's your horoscope? What's you know, part of the <laughs> the medicine and, and sort of taking care of people involved that? Well, let's read your horoscope. Like, yeah. what what was what were the stars like whenever you were born? Because there was the belief that the universe is this ordered place, and that the levels of 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 reality uh, mirror each other in some way. An example of this would be like, well, there's God, and God created all this stuff. And therefore, God is sort of the father of reality in the same way that a father in a family is the father, is the head of that family, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of like what you might call like sympathetic systems. Oh, yeah, and definitely. We're looking to the stars because they yeah. exert influence over us. But all that's just what we thought up because we were like, I don't know, didn't quite know how the universe worked. Yeah, it didn't know that we're actually in an expanding universe and that we are hurling around a galaxy <laughs> and we're hurling inside of a solar system. So we are changing positions constantly. constantly. And by the way, those aren't stars. Those are other galaxies. Right, right, right. Um, so it, it, but whatever. Of, so you can use that as a basis <laughs> and, and go like, well, what if that's really how it works in D&D? &D? What, yeah. what if the universe is a static, unchanging place that follows these patterns and the, the, the stars are portals to other realms or, or, or something different, right? Then you can start to like change things up and manipulate them and go like, yeah, how, how do these things influence my world? This is building up, you know, to basically like the cosmic horror campaign in which a, a new star appearing in the night sky is the herald for a doom you're gonna have to deal with, you know, yeah. 20 something levels later. Right. Uh, that's, that's kind of what you're, what the star spawn are, are there for to help you build that kind of game. Exactly. So that comet is coming. Yeah. And now it's here. And now it's here. Let's get to the actual, get the to the, to, to the heat of the meat, sure. so yeah. to speak. The star spawn grew. <laughs> now, grew. <laughs> I am grew. Yeah, I can imagine a bunch of little maggot things. They are kind of the, the less. Yeah. Lesser yeah. than. The lesser than, yeah. But they can be one of the most important. To, well, you're right. to the greater than. And that's yes. why I, I love about the group, and like you were saying, there's a lot of synergy between them. Mm -hmm. uh, that aura of madness that they have, giving yep. you disadvantage on your saves yep. and attacks against others, not them. Not so they know they're the weak ones, right? but they know that they have a job to do. 
to have a job to do. And that's to make you weaker. Right. Some of the attacks uh, by a star spawn might be preceded by a giant wave of Gru that just mm -hmm. sort of uh, rush over the party and, and start softening them up for it for the big ones who have been. Or yeah. it could be, now you kind of like think about it, maybe they're behind this sort of like front rank and it's a bunch of like hulks and manglers and then the Gru or a second wave imposing that disadvantage on saves and then once you know you're say round two or three that's when they start attacking now you're they're granting uh, disadvantage to uh, mm -hmm. the party because they're confounding bite oh yeah or, you know I mean there, there's all kinds of ways that you can use them but what I like about it is is like this is highlighting the fact that number one bounded accuracy is a, is a feature of the system it's a strength we're supposed to be able to see lower CR creatures still a threat and still a part of the combats uh, that take place at higher levels, right? So this is showing us a way that you can do that. They're, they've got abilities that synergize with the other monsters that are there, plus the fact that they themselves in mass could potentially be a threat. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in that way they're like the Wretched from Sorrow Sorcerer, Sworn, in yep. which you know, they're there to bolster and strengthen the higher CR monsters because you, you just need, you don't really want to have them out there by themselves, the higher CR. You want to have some kind mm -hmm. of minion or, or something that they can rely yeah. on. Yeah, and you need a, you need a little guy that uh, actually will draw the attention of the players, and, and they, they will do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, waste an attack getting rid of this thing so that you can attack the other thing without the disadvantage, but now you've wasted the attack. You know, it's just mm -hmm. which target is my real priority? Which one of them is like the linchpin that's keeping this all together? And like force you to think about how you approach a fight, and this from the player side, because all of these creatures work so well together. They're not these individual atomized monsters that are all thrown on the table and then the dungeon master kind of like just plays them. They are a cohesive unit that fights together. And then, like you said, in the front ranks, you're probably going to have uh, the SS Hulk. The Hulk, yes. As I have written down, <laughs> which I realize like that's a great, that's a great ship title. Right. But um, <laughs> that psychic mirror, man. Let yeah. me tell you something. And even for people doing psychic damage, that's for the for the, oh, for the big boys right, to do right. psychic damage to them. To them, yeah. And so like you, you look at it, you're like, it's a oh. fun. <laughs> you're like, oh, I guess this is to prevent the vicious mockery from hurting the yeah, whole. Yeah. Or, well, there's more psychic spells than that now. But yeah. this is an ability that's less about like providing a defense against player psychic attacks and more like. Listen, there's a lot of the, the larva mage and the seer have, have the means to kind of, particularly the seer, yep. which it says will often accompany the Hulk, have a lot of ways to trigger that psychic mirror so that the Hulk becomes a hu an amplifying hub mm -hmm. for what was otherwise a single target psychic attack. It's now a, a small AOE. It's, I mean, it's just like, mo it's like mobile artillery. Yeah. It runs around and attacks and every now and again, boom. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Some questions to answer there are, do two of them, which are within 10 feet of each other, create an infinite psychic feedback loop that would liquefy the brains of anyone <laughs> around them? That's a question you will have to ask or answer yourself. Yeah. Currently, if, you a, if you got a Hulk on either side and a seer pointing its orb at you, you're like, you just might want to be like, I give up. I give, I give up. up. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. done. <laughs> I'm done. I don't want my brain to run out my ear because uh -huh. I took uh, infinite psychic damage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> infinite <laughs> psychic damage. Or like a larva mage hitting both with an eldritch blast. <laughs> You're right. Uh, uh, actually, no, it's force. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, you could like push someone into it if you modify their eldritch blast with it. Like push yeah. them into the, the range of the Hulk. But, so you'll um, have to answer that question. As it stands, there's no cap on how often it can be triggered, how often you take the damage, and so you might want to just like consider placing some limitations on it if you feel the need to like put multiple hulks in there. Yeah, like I mean, I'm sorry, I would just do, it's the initial damage and that's it. Just like once like around, it, yeah. they take the thing. Yeah, I, you, you know, you hit it, they take it, it goes out, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's not gonna bounce back and bounce, you know, gotcha, you, can't, gotcha. you can't take the damage that you gave out to someone else to give back to you. Right, right, right. I, I might use that trick Thus if I was- the entropy of the universe. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to keep putting psychic damage into it for it to expand. Yeah, yeah okay, I can see that, yeah. You know. I, I think I, I might do it if I was looking to challenge a really high level party. Yeah, if, yeah. If, you know, the, we're talking about a CR-10 and a CR-13 creature, or maybe two CR, in this case, two CR-10 and a CR-13, like, on paper, you might not think that that would challenge a tier three or a tier four mm -hmm. party that much. But if you say, like, yeah, don't, you can't get within 10 feet of these unless you have something like Mind Blank on, rendering you immune to the psychic. And now it's a, a puzzle where it's like, well, 
shit, we can't get that close to them. Do we have enough ranged attacks to mm -hmm. deal with them that way? You know, do we have a crowd control or forced movement that can yeah. keep them split apart? Uh, so you might throw a challenge like that and just be like, yeah, these two together, or these three monsters together produce infinite psychic damage. Yeah. You're going to have to figure out how to defeat them with well, that in play. I mean, just think about the daisy chain of events that would happen if you had, like, four hulks <laughs> lined up and right. you hit one, it's just like, bump, <laughs> bump, bump, yeah. bump, and... Yeah, well, I think I got four uh, hulks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they all use the reaping arm attack they against all use the everyone. Uh -huh. uh, that's the other one, right? They yeah. attack everything with a slam. Within, within 10 feet. And it's like, that's kind of ridiculous. So you've got a monster here with the Hulk that is meant to be up close and personal, mm -hmm. meant to be in the party's face. And then if you combine it with, say, like the Seer and their ability to alter the position of people around the battlefield with bend space and then collapsing distance. Yeah, collapse distance, yeah. Um, the way that they can move both allies and enemies around the place, plus the fact that they have a psychic attack. It all starts to really kind of like start to see how the encounter plays out with a maybe a wave of Gru and then the hulks that, that are amongst them followed by a, a seer. While we're still on it, like I know we kind of jumped around, but like Hulk to seer, like what else about the seer do you... Uh, do oh, you dude, the out of phase movement is just ridiculous. The fact that they're just always out of phase and if they yeah. walk through you, you take damage. I do like that they actually specify, like you can't just forward, reverse, right, forward, right, right. reverse. <laughs> you know, it's like just once around. But still, you could use all of your movement to attack a whole line of people. Imagine oh, yeah. one of these things coming out uh, against the frontline grunts that all have, you know, five hit points. Yeah. And then they all drop as this thing walks through walks them. Walks through them, right. Um, and that's just its opening move is walking into yep. the scene. Yeah. Uh, that's just fucking terrifying. But that, of, that Comet staff, though, it's got a lot, a lot to it. Like I, look, it's, it's like you can hit them, but if you do two-handed, it's a little extra damage. Uh -huh. Then you got to save, or you take more. Yeah, and it's just like there's a lot going on. And there's like the the, the big psychic orb. Was there another big attack? So they're like, they're good. They've got they've got a lot going on. They've got mobility. They can mess with people. Mm -hmm. They can they have things that benefit their allies, things that, that harm their enemies. They have a variety of different attacks. It's like a solid mid-level, mid to high level, like lieutenant monster mm -hmm. that, uh, that'll really spice up an encounter with Star Spawn. Yeah, um, and, 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 the, and that's the thing is, like we already talked about, you have the Gru there all giving everybody disadvantage on all of these saves. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, I can totally see how this becomes a maggot-strewn TPK. Right. Uh, if you if if you do it just right, uh -huh, uh -huh. It, just everything goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but oh, yeah, yeah but, you definitely could. Sure. But that's why that's why you play these because what the CR is what CR like seventeen. 13. 13? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, you're dealing with something that's, uh, it, you know, it's a comparable, I think, like, the Archmage is around that mm -hmm. as well. So, you're dealing with creatures that, uh, you know, I would throw a Seer at a party probably as early as around 7th or 8th level. Yeah. Like, maybe by themselves or with one Hulk. Uh, particularly if like the party's like well, well rested or ready or something like that, but you start them off with things like manglers and waves of Gru, and and because there's five of the different star spawn, you can put them all together in different combinations to produce different sort of things. The mangler itself is a creature that hits hard, and if you're playing it like the stats suggest you would play it, which is that it hangs out hiding in the shadows until it can use a burst of movement and like six attacks against one creature and then like get all the bonuses it gets from that flurry of claws plus ambush plus the the shadow uh, stealth mm -hmm. feature in one go and otherwise it doesn't come out of hiding you're gonna have to go find that thing you're yeah. gonna have to go root it out and chances are where you're where you're encountering these creatures it's you're probably already at a, a disadvantage from like dark or, or something else is attacking you imagine like a singular single mangler stalking the battlefield while you're having to deal with a brute seer combination Right, these two are just over here distracting you and causing uh, all kinds of problems, and then the mangler rushes out of the shadows and drops six attacks on one of your, uh, you know, casters or something, and, and then it's just back it's gone. Into, it's, it's gone. Um, what are you going to you know, ready in action to shoot it with one arrow when it comes out, or blast it with one spell? Try to get like a like a hold person on it at it, least it's hope, something. You hope right, and, and that's assuming that you're you're able to do that. And yeah, not distracted by something else, using those spells for something else. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a uh, it's a force multiplier in that respect, <laughs> and just like a really fast skirmishing monster that punches above its, uh, its weight. Uh, the, the last yeah. of these monsters, which I think is the most disgusting. 
The larva mage. The larva mage. <laughs> just like a mass of worms that got sentient and started casting spells and shit. It's just like, kind of makes me want to throw up just thinking about it. There's like a, a sense in which the, the larva mage is this creature that has uh, taken over the, a warlock or a cultist mm -hmm. or something like that. And you can imagine that process being, first off, horrific. Yeah, when, uh, you, when a, that star, <laughs> star pack warlock pisses off their patron. Right, or like they, you know, they've been fooled. They think like, oh yeah, you, you know, you're, 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 you know, we're preparing the way for the herald. You know, yeah. the herald will arrive, et cetera, et cetera. And what the warlock doesn't realize is that they are the vessel. That, yeah. that, that they're that a, a a knot of wormy corruption is going to be placed in them somewhere and will slowly eat them and take them over. That kind of thing. Um, the big thing with the larva mage to me is the fact that it gets like three dominates, a plague of worms. Uh, mm -hmm. Where it's like a, a, you got to get up and close and personal. This is where maybe the seer helps the larva mage get closer, using its abilities to kind of like transport allies around the battlefield. And now you've got a big burst of AOE damage. Yeah. If if they end up killing it, it's going to become a little swarm of worms itself. But if you've got say the Gru that are there. Uh, that are helping to uh, you know, weaken the party. Mm -hmm. um, they're now giving the benefit uh, of their disadvantage on, imposing disadvantage on saves. The larva mage is going to benefit from that, from the uh, fatal heal. weakness. Yeah, yeah. The temp it's just all kinds of, of synergies and tactics and everything that you can do to make for a memorable encounter, and as it should be, because yeah. these are creatures that are like heralds of elder evils, and they're spawned from the stars themselves in a, in a DD world, and so it should be memorable. It should be tough. It should be something where you're having to deal with powers and abilities that are not normal, or that you don't always have to deal with. So, how do you not kill your party? <laughs> Right. Because, I mean, when you, when you really, yeah. like, start picking it apart, if you, A, if you're a DM and you actually remember all of these abilities. For one, right, right, right. Like, yeah. you, you're, you're up to maybe a little bit higher. Like, yeah. maybe your party is all 13th level. And so yeah. this is where you're going to have, you're going to have your seers there, the, the larva majors are, majors are going to be there. Like, all five of these are going to be taking the field at the same time. Oh, yeah, like, it's the big showdown big with showdown all the heralds, yeah. And, you know, and say you remember every ability. Uh -huh. And then you start to look and realize like, holy shit, I might kill everybody. You could, right? Like I think that like it's always important to remember that fifth edition is, is weighted with the player in mind and weighted with the fact that they want the game to continue. We want the yeah. story of these characters to continue. So like none of they don't have anything that would like really make me stand out and like in, they don't have any instant death effects. That's true. Right? There's nothing that they've got that's like oh my god, they, they, like you're going to drop and it's going to be it's going to cascade into a TPK <laughs> that you might have. So there's still some time to say bring people back up. A lot of what they do is up close and personal. So Hulk, Larva Mage, uh, the, the Mangler, the heavy hitters of this tend to be melee where you want to be really close involved uh, in with them. So stay Staying at range, using the considerable power that ranged attacks have in 5th edition, all the different spells at your own disposal, uh, you know, that's how you, you know, can survive a fight like this. Think smart. You know, if there's a big creature and it looks like the, the, the monsters around it are, are going to rely on that big creature to, like, I don't know, be the battering ram or the anchor around which they fight or something like that, then stay the hell away from that creature. Yes. You know, uh, rely on the tools at your disposal to uh, deal with this challenge. They, they hit hard in combat. They are tough. So you're going to have to play smart when you're dealing with them. That's how, that's how I would sort of handle that mm -hmm. situation. But you, you also, as a DM, need to kind of modulate how you how tough you play these kind of yeah. games you know if you have a, if you have a group that's looking for a real real challenge then you go for the throat if you don't then you just hold back a bit you know and and use the creepy abilities selectively maybe you don't use say flurry of claws it's going to come up 50% of the time right Maybe you just uh, change the uh, <laughs> the recurrence on it from four to six to five to six, or you don't use it every time it comes up. Uh, those are different ways that you can ensure you don't accidentally like <laughs> completely destroy the party when you didn't mean to, or that's not what uh, you wanted to go for in the first place, or something like that. So, closing thoughts, Jim. I, I think to me. The big thing about Star Spawn is that they represent more than just a monster. They represent a campaign event. 
Yeah. That they are tied to these elder evils. And the elder evils themselves, whether it's Therizadun or, or Zargon the Returner or, or any number of them, right? Like there's a ton of them. Uh, and if you're really curious about them, there's a third edition product called Elder Evils, which breaks a lot of these down and, and talks about like how you would run a campaign out of it. Guess what? Written by Rob Schwal. Um, <laughs> and uh, it really delves into how you turn these creatures, which are more than just demon princes and evil gods, but are just like truly man malevolent entities in a D&D &D world, uh, into a force for your campaign. How you build an entire structure around it, how you do that reveal from the slow burn of an investigation to the dawning horror of what's at stake to the orgy of violence that uh, whenever one of these creatures arrives. So it's worth thinking about them in those terms. You're not just like, they're not just like random creatures you find. These are creatures that are in your campaign because you want to sort of frame an entire campaign around the arrival of one of these elder evils or the rising influence of one of these elder evils yeah. in the world. It's worth like thinking about them like that and not just saying like, oh, I, I, I want to use an aberration, this looks good. All right, here we go, have a random adventure based on these creatures. Like, they deserve some thought. Make a campaign out of them. Really, really invest in them and showcase what makes them so horrifying which is that they are aspects of these elder evils that are capable of entering the world without needing to be summoned, without needing to have a mortal bring them there. Yeah. And they will exert influence and, and change the world so that it resembles more of what these elder evils want. Uh, and that's the terrifying thing, because the elder evils are just wicked and terrible uh, <laughs> and worthy of a campaign villain for sure. Yes. Where I go flag and yes. be thy name. <laughs> Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. Want to see us play? We've got games every week on Twitch, which we upload to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. If you like the video, hit that subscribe button, click the bell, give us a thumbs up, and tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching. Okay. All right. Fucking hell. <coughs> wow. Um. Ooh, solid.